Welcome to the Backyard Bounty Podcast from HeritageAcresMarket.com, where we talk about all things backyard poultry, beekeeping, gardening, sustainable living, and more. And now, here's your host, Nicole. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Backyard Bounty. Today, we're talking with Douglas Buffington, the creator of the Facebook page, Peacocks Only. And Douglas is an amazing gentleman that has many years of experience raising peafowl. Uh, He has answers to every question that you could possibly have about them. And his Facebook page is a wonderful resource for experienced and new peafowl owners. There's a bunch of great people on there that can answer a number of questions. I know that I've used them several times for questions that I've had with my peafowl throughout the years. And today um, I recorded with Douglas via Skype. So this episode is going to be a little bit different in that after this introduction, I'm basically just going to play for you the phone conversation effectively that, that we had together. So I love Doug. He it was so much fun talking to him and I learned so much. And this episode is going to be wonderful for anybody that is thinking about getting started with PFAL or has already maybe started this season. It's going to address a lot of the questions that people have and some of the things that you need to have on hand for them, treating some illnesses that are really common. And this was an episode that I was really excited to record. And I hope that you all enjoy learning all there is to know about PFAL. It's Nicole. How are you? Oh, okay. Well, what do you want to know about PFAL? Well, first of all, I wanted to thank you again. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me and everything. You have been such a vital resource, I know, for me and my PFAL. And you, I just have so much information and and I think it's so kind of you to share with everybody and your Facebook group is the best. I just absolutely love it and everybody there is great and anytime I have any question about my PFAL, I know that I can find the answer there and it has made things a lot easier because they're not quite as easy as chickens sometimes. (laughs) Well, you know, uh, I tell people I'm an old man with uh, too little to do and too much time. so (laughs) I I just put it into the group. Sure. And I appreciate your compliment. Oh, of course. I was a school teacher for 31 years, so uh, I, I, I'm afraid all my files look like lessons. Oh, <laughs> well, I think I, I'm pretty uh, analytical, so that works great for me. I think it's, you know, I can find what I need and it's there and, and there's not a whole lot of fluff and it just gets down to it and, and I like it. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, so what kind of peacocks do you have? You know, I actually just have one pair. Um, I've got an India blue male and a black shoulder female. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, those go good together. Yeah. Uh, But the the peacocks, they all are carrying so many uh, recessive genes that you you can be pretty sure what you're going to get, but uh, you get a surprise kind of regular. Oh, really? Yeah. So there are 125 different uh, colors and color patterns of peacocks. A lot of people are just amazed to know that because all they've seen is blue and maybe white. Mm -hmm. But there's that many. And uh, none of us have seen them all. People in the group keep asking, what what do you get if you cross this with that? (laughs) But who knows? You know, (laughs) we've never even seen them. And and we don't know what kind of genes they're carrying. So, uh, like I said, you're you're allowed to get uh, uh, just about anything. Sure. On the on the real expensive colors, though, they don't mix them up too much with the other birds. They want to keep them to where the uh, mating results are pretty predictable because, uh, they, the, you know, the birds have a, a better value. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I know that my male, I actually hatched him out of some eggs that I was gifted from a family friend. And then I got my female last year, and I'm not sure how old she is, but she has some decent-sized spurs. So I'm assuming she's at least of laying age. But she ended up getting a little hurt this year and scratched up her face pretty good. And we've been working on getting that healed. And I'm not sure if maybe that was why, but she she hasn't laid any eggs this year. Well, that's kind of a common complaint this year and especially last year. People waited for their eggs all summer long. So it's always something with these peacocks. You know, one year the season ends too early. Uh, The next year they didn't get any eggs. The next year they didn't hatch. And it's always something with them. You know, that's when we become next year people. That's what I say. Next year is always going to be better. We get into a bad year, and then we start talking about next year. Peacock eggs don't uh, incubate very well uh, on top of everything else. Uh, If you put them under a turkey hen or a chicken hen, you're going to do a lot better. But the the peacock hens are just not real reliable setters. Sometimes they'll stay on the nest, and sometimes they get halfway through and then abandon it, and sometimes they never sit. So uh, they're they're not... uh, 
If you have an alternative, you know you got something else you can put them under, you probably ought to go with it. Yeah, I hatched out um, some last year just in my incubator, and I only set, I think it was, yeah, I set three eggs and I had two hatch, so I was pretty happy with that. Yeah, you 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 got uh, about as good as anybody gets, two-thirds, two-thirds hatch of everything you pick up because, uh, you know, when I count my infertiles and those that don't hatch and... And all of that, uh, you know, if I got two thirds, uh, two thirds of them that result in chicks, I'm I'm pretty happy. It, it's not like chicken eggs. The chicken eggs hatch a lot better. Yeah, I th- chicken eggs. It seems like it doesn't take a whole lot, and you know, it's pretty easy to get pretty close to 100 percent of uh, fertile hatch on the chicken eggs. They take wide swings in uh, uh, temperatures and humidity pretty well too. You know, uh, you can have a fluctuating temperature of a couple of degrees or. So humidity that's not exactly right, you'll still get a decent hatch. But peacocks, you got to do everything right, and still, you know, it uh, often is disappointing. Sure. What kind of incubator do you use? I use the GQF, but I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm pretty disgusted with all of them. Um, GQF, uh, I just can't speak ill enough about their incubators. They, they um, you know, you pay about $1,000 for one of them now by the time you buy the trays and the, and the egg, uh, the egg crate. It's the you know the part that the egg rests on, and then you got to buy the metal trays. And so I bought one, and it took me a whole year to figure out that the they got digital readouts now. You can't just get the old fashioned one. That it was under reporting the humidity by ten points. Oh my gosh! And then uh, the other one, the other one, they had some kind of uh, I finally wormed it out of the support guy. There was some kind of defect in the electrical system on the fans, and I blew my fans out. And it shut the whole incubator down. And luckily, I found it and and switched the eggs to another incubator. And, and they seem to have had like uh, they haven't been cooled down for very long. But uh, you know, I could have lost the whole incubator of eggs. I I just don't know why somebody doesn't make a plain old fashioned incubator anymore with double wafers and a fan in it and no digital stuff. That digital stuff on top of the, on top of everything else, the digital readings are never. Accurate. You have to take your own temperature reading. For example, on one of mine to get 99.5, I have to set it on 101.5. Set the digital control and the humidity. Oh, who knows how far off it is? The only way you can actually know what's going on inside your incubator is to take what's called a wet bulb test. And everybody treats a wet bulb test like it's some kind of rocket science, and it's the easiest thing in the world to do. But you're never going to know exactly what your humidity is without taking a wet bulb reading. And how do you do a wet bulb reading then? Well, you have to buy a special thermometer with a spike on it, and you get those from Guess Who, GQF. <laughs> and uh, you have to drill a hole in the side because they don't send a mechanical thermometer with, you know, with a needle. They don't send those with them anymore because if they sent those with them, they would never agree with a digital. So you read about a five, six inch spike on it, and uh, they, they've got a, a wicking, like a sock. You get that wicking, you put it on about two-thirds of the way up, and you let the other part sit in the water reservoir. And when the temperature is like 99.5 in the incubator, the wet bulb reading um, depending on, uh, should be 86, 86 degrees. That's 60% humidity for a peacock egg. And you, you take your reading, and you adjust the humidity by opening and closing the vents. You, you want your intake port to be wide open, but your exhaust vent, you either restrict it or open it up to adjust till you get the right humidity. And it's important to know that the incubator has to be in a place where the ambient temperatures and humidities are stable. Like uh, I keep mine in the washroom with the humidity and temperature and there never never changes. Because uh, if you have wide fluctuations in the temperature and the humidity, then you're going to have trouble controlling the humidity inside the incubator too. And if the temperature outside swings enough, you'll have trouble controlling the temperature also. I think that's one thing that a lot of people struggle with is, you know, they usually want to have their incubators out somewhere that they can look at it and it's usually in the you know, maybe in the living room and then they have their central air run and on during the day or maybe not at night. And so, yeah, those temperature fluctuations, those are hard for those incubators to keep up with them. It's worse if you, uh, if you have them out in the shed somewhere because once the temperature outside the incubator reaches 90 degrees, I wish I had a technical explanation for you, but your incubator simply doesn't function for anymore and your eggs are going to go bad. You get 90 degrees or better and it's not going to be able to, it's just not going to be able to have your incubator hatch like you want. And, and it's frequently high, that high. You know, I've, I've measured if you're out here in my barns sometimes at 
95 to 100 degrees, and it's, it's inside the barn. Oh, sure. But when you hatch your chicks, it's important that you leave them in the incubator. A lot of them have these desktop incubators, and they don't have room for it. Once it catches, you got to get them out. But if you have a cabinet incubator where you've got room down in the hatching, uh, down in the bottom, the hatching tray, it's important to in there until the third day. They're, they're not like chickens or guinea or, or quail. They're not going to just jump up and start running. They It takes them about 24 hours just to uncurl their feet, and then uh, they're just not going to be strong enough and active enough to get out of the incubator to the third day. And people ask about, you know, how do they eat and drink while they're in there? Here's what some people don't realize is, is that a chick will not eat or drink typically for the first three days because they've got that yolk in them and that's what they're that's what they're living on so if you offer food or water they won't take it yeah i know that with the yolk i see that question also all the time and obviously when mama bird is sitting on eggs not all of the eggs hatch at exactly the same time and there can be a natural variation of several days so they kind of have that built-in um buffer and then the yolk so that everybody can make it through three days without dying of starvation or dehydration if you got your hands out and they're laying out in the field somewhere you never people say oh you know my chick they're hatching they're doing just fine you never see the chicks that can't walk can't keep up or the ones that just don't make it in with the hen. So you really don't know how you're doing exactly. Yeah, that's a good point. I've actually never really thought about that just because I'm so used to chickens that are in a nest box. And so it's, you know, if some mm-hmm. of them don't make it, you don't, you don't see them. But um, yeah, that's a really great point. Let's talk about free, free ranging, quote, free ranging. It's, it's, I'm not a fan of that because Whenever you just turn a bird out and you set some feed and water out, they're pretty much on their own, especially a hen on a nest. You never know what's coming in the night. And I, I've seen nests, too, where uh, the chicks start to hatch. And like I said, some hatch before others. And the ants will find them. And an ants will go, if there's, a, if there's a hole in the egg where they're starting to break out, the ants will go down in that hole in the egg and start feeding on that chick. And next thing you know, the hen... Uh, can't sit on the nest when it's full of ants, and she gets up with two or three chicks and, and takes off. And there's dogs, possums, coons, uh, you name it. Uh, they're they're going to come, and, uh, and and you're going to lose you're going to lose hens. I don't know how they stay hid out there for thirty days to, to hatch anything. Yeah, I'm not a huge fan of free ranging, just for those similar issues, the predators, and and it seems like it's just inevitable to lose a bird, and especially with the peafowl that are, you know, it would just devastate me if I lost one. Somebody made the point one time, too, that peacocks die in pens, too. Uh, things get in the pen and kill them. And, uh, and, and, and another thing about uh, keeping peacocks in a pen, you've got to have a big pen, you know. They, otherwise, they, they keep reinfecting themselves with parasites and protozoans like coccidiosis and blackhead. And you have to keep up a good worm regimen and stay on top of their health. And, and a peacock's immune system is never going to be as strong as a chicken, which is kept in captivity for at least the last 10,000 years. And, you know, only the strongest have made it this far. They're, they're kind of like a turkey's immune system. You know, turkeys, they get blackhead. That's a kiss of death. And they used to put things like metronidazole in the feed up until the early 90s, used to put it in the feed. And uh, then they uh, decided that uh, that medication wasn't any good for people. You know, there are residuals that come forward in the eggs. There's a whole class of those drugs that are very similarly related. It's not just the metronidazole, but they, they come forward in the uh, in the eggs and then chickens like you get at Walmart, they'll feed them that medication right up to slaughter. And, and they're starting to find residuals in humans that wasn't doing them any good. And it's coming at you from every direction because you're using those same medications to treat livestock with. So you sit down to eat in the morning, it's in the milk, it's in the bacon, it's in the egg. And uh, at noon, here you go again. It's in the beef and then uh, the hot dogs and whatever else. You know, you're 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 constantly exposed to this stuff on a daily basis. So when they took the medications out of the feed, we uh, everybody kept wondering, you know, why my turkeys and peacocks are dying. And so uh, I finally figured out what we needed to do to get them to live and uh, the, the medications you need. And they took everything off the shelf two or three years ago. But you can still get medications at the pigeon sites. And sometimes the sites that sell um, medications for fish, tropical fish. And the reason why you can get the medications there and not anywhere else, if you know what to ask for, 
and you know where to look, you can still get some medications and, and keep your birds alive. But the um, the reason why you can still get them at those places, the pigeon sites and the pet stores, is because the Federal Drug Administration identified only five birds as poultry. They listed the birds out, geese, ducks, chickens, turkeys, and guineas. And so you couldn't put anything in the feed for any of those, but they did not mention pigeons. I don't think pigeons are a significant part of the food supply. Do you think? Are they up north, maybe? Um, Not here. <laughs> well, they used to sell them in the stores all the time. I remember one time reading about uh, this book that was written back in the 40s about pigeons, maybe early 50s. And it was a guy in Arizona. He said he had some kind of mites. You know, they, they take those squab right out of the nest just before they leave the nest, and that, that's when they uh, send them to market. There was quite a market at one time for them. And he said he had some mites in there, and he, he couldn't get rid of them. So he got a hold of some DDT powder, and he said, we put powder right in the nest, and he said, put it on some of the chicks. We just dusted the chick, the uh, you know squab with them. And uh, he said that mite left, and it never came back. And I thought, what about those poor people who's sticking their hand down in that powder and, you know, putting it all over and wearing, breathing it and sniffing it, getting it on their hands? And then the people eating the squab, what about them? Yeah. So we uh, we don't have the DDT anymore, and it's a good thing, too. Yeah, that that was some nasty stuff. Uh, what, what they discovered was, one of the bad things about it was, that it caused eggshells to get thin. And then those birds, which eat like vultures and... Uh, Eagles and hawks, those that fed on mice, you know, what you would have was is the mice would feed on the corn. They've been treated with the DDT, and, and you get a buildup in them. Whatever ate the mice would get another buildup. And, and they discovered that the, the, the eggs of the eagle, for example, were breaking in the nest because they were too thin. And they simply had to get the DDT for, for that and other reasons out of the environment or we weren't going to have any more we're going to have any more eagles for sure yeah that would absolutely Con have been a tragedy <laughs> yeah condor vultures and any number of other birds and and like i said just kept building up you get a fox that eats so many mice and uh an owl and uh, then some something eats the fox and it, it, it just keeps concentrating as it goes up the food chain but hey at least we would have corn to eat <laughs> <laughs> yeah there you go huh <laughs> corn is a uh, uh, an interesting product. There's there's some products that uh, you wonder how uh, civilization could exist without them because they're so vital to our existence. One of them is uh, corn, rice, soybeans, potatoes, and just beans in general. You ever think of sometimes what we do if any one of those like rice was subtracted from the food supply? You know how many million people depend on rice. You ever thought about that? Yeah, it's probably it's, half the half the world, I'm sure. Oh, at India, least. China, that's two thirds of the world's population alone. Yeah, and then they put it in everything too. Yeah, yeah. My dad made the observation one time, and uh, when you think about it, you don't. It's true. He said every animal, including people, he said every animal will eat corn, and it's true. I see my squirrels coming to the feeder, but I see rabbits coming up here, woodpeckers even come up. Everything eats corn. I can't think of anything that would not eat corn. Yeah, I can't think of anything either. That's that's an interesting thought. Yeah, it's a vital ingredient of all livestock feed. Mm -hmm. Corn is. And it goes into cat food and it goes into everything. Here in the U.S., 80 to 90 percent of all of our corn, we have perfect corn growing conditions. That, and of course, the equipment and the land to grow it. And 80 to 90 percent is exported. The rest of the world just doesn't, just not able to grow corn. Of course, we're not able to grow a whole lot of rice either. Yeah, that's that's a challenge to grow rice, you know, in the middle of Texas, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, we, we do some down here in southeast Texas where it's closer to Louisiana border. And Louisiana grows a, a pretty good bit of, I think there's some, there's some over maybe in southern, way down south in California. I don't know, there's another place over there in, in west in the west there that down and down toward Mexico that grows it. And of course, Mexico grows a fair bit of it. The peacock seemed to be a, uh, a, a bird of increasing popularity. It uh, started about 2005. The interest in them started perking up. And maybe it was the internet and the access, but also people are learning how to keep them alive. They, they just don't tolerate coccidiosis and, and uh, what's called blackhead. It's a histomoniasis. And it's it's a protozoan also that, that attacks the liver in birds. It actually hijacks a ride into the bird system by being on sequel worms. 
And it does the parasite on sequel worms, and of course the birds develop sequel worms, and then the protozoans find their way to the liver, and it, uh, it'll kill them. We first noticed uh, blackhead in this country about 1881 or 82. It came in from China with some pheasants that were imported, and the uh, pheasants are pretty well immune to blackhead, but it, it's devastating to turkeys especially. Turkeys just don't have immunity to it. Well, after 140 years, that and coccidiosis was first identified. Who knows how long it's been here, but it was first identified about 1903. And um, after, after 100 to 120, 30, 40 years with those experience with those in this country, we have to assume that every bird in the United States, and maybe in the whole world, I'm sure, has some amount of coccidiosis and blackhead protozoan in them. But their immune systems can handle a low level of it. It's just whenever the birds get old or stressed or sick with something else like a respiratory infection, then their their, their immune systems can't hold it in check anymore. And that's why some of the birds will get sick and some won't. Respiratory infections are another big uh, problem with uh, sinus infections, their eyes swelling up, and then then that gets down into their lungs. And uh, you treat that with antibiotics. Uh, you have to give them antibiotic injections for that. This is not hard to do, but uh, you got to stay on top of treating the sick bird because they they go down fast if you if you if you're not careful. I know online. I see you often post the five and one purchased from the pigeon supply store, like you talked about earlier. Mm-hmm. Do you mm-hmm. use the five and one if they have a respiratory infection as well, or do you just do injections of, I'm assuming, Tylen or something like that? Well, let me tell you about 5-in-1 and All-in-1 and Factor 5. And uh, that, that same product is sold under three or four different names, uh, but it's the same thing. It has uh, it has medications in it for the protozoans that, that your bird will get, which is canker, you know, it's pigeon canker, sometimes makes its way into peacocks and blackhead, coccidiosis, and hexamida. So it has medications for that. And uh, it also has a, uh, what they call a combo pack. There's an amount of probiotics, amino acids, and proteins, and, and uh, different things that will speed a recovery. And but and it also has some Thailand powder for antibiotic. But what I've found is that the amount of antibiotic in the all-in-one or five-in-one it's not strong enough to kick a, uh, a respiratory infection by itself. So what I recommend is you give an injection and then you give the 5-in-1 or the all-in-1 uh, along with it. And it's got a worm medication in it, too. It, it, it's, uh, it'll, it'll start, bird will start expelling worms in uh, oh, less than 12 hours. But, but here's the thing about those medications that you put in the drinking water. Your bird has to be drinking normally in order for them to do you any good. And... Uh, you can syringe that medicated water down their throat, which, which is a, a, another another story on how to do it. But the best thing to do is, if they're not drinking, is to give them a shot of antibiotic, usually three quarter cc for a grown peacock, three quarter cc of uh, LA 200 or one generic forms from tractor supply. Give them uh, an injection and and give them uh, metronidazole uh, tablets. Uh, you have to search around. Uh, if you look in my group, I, I can give you some sources, you know, for, for metronidazole where you don't need a vet's prescription. And uh, as long as they're, they're very okay because, you know, your peacocks are not going to be part of the food supply. But it won't kick a, a respiratory infection, uh, the 5-in-1 and all in one. It won't kick it by itself completely. But you give them a five-day treatment of one and you give them an injection of antibiotics on, on the front of it if they're if they're not breathing normally. I can hear your what peas was in the background. Your, your, <laughs> yeah, yeah. What what was it that your bird had? Uh, you had a sick bird at last year once. Um, I know that I talked to you. I think it was last year. Oh gosh, I don't even remember what the issue with them was. Oh, my chickens. I reached out to you because my chickens had expelled some tapeworms in their feces and I knew that, you know, the peafowl oh, was yeah. different, but yeah. I, I knew that you would have the answer and that was that was probably one of the most disgusting experiences I've ever had with poultry. That I was bet. awful. You know, there's a number of good worm medications and some of them are easier to give than others, but the 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 one that is the absolutely the worst, Wazine, and it's so obsolete it shouldn't even be on the shelf. It only controls roundworms, and there's about four different worms that attack birds. Roundworms is only one of them. So if you believe you have worms and you give them Wazine, you may not be hit the right worm, and certainly not all of them. Uh, but there's Panicure, Valbasin, Safeguard, 
one of my favorites is ivermectin because ivermectin, again, you can get one of its uh, lower cost generics for tractor supply, but you mix uh, three, three, three cc's to a gallon of water and for three days and it will take care of absolutely every kind of worm. Plus, if you have lice or ticks or mites or anything else, it gets the external uh, parasites too. It just wipes the, wipes the sweat clean. So it, it's, a, it's a good one, and it's easy to deliver, but, but again, your bird has to be drinking normally to benefit from it. So with your worming regimen, do you recommend the Invermectin or doing the five-in-one and just kind of knocking anything else out that they might have? Well, i tell you what I, what I do. I, I, uh, because I, I don't have chickens or any other poultry, uh, I and, and my birds have a, you know an, an area which are, they're not tightly controlled, got tightly confined. They stay healthier, so I only have to give them medications twice a year. So about a month before the laying season starts, I give them a, a treatment of uh, uh, of the five in one, or, or in, in my case, all in one. I give them a five day treatment of it, and this cleans out the worms. Any level, it knocks down the levels of of uh, infections, protozoans, and and the tylen will take care of any residual. Infection that they might have, which is what they call subclinical, you know, they're not exhi- exhibiting symptoms, but they they may have uh, they may have some level of it, because you don't want to go into laying season with any kind of uh, bacteria in your hands, because it's transmitted to the egg, some of it, and uh, vertically to the egg, and then to the embryo, and sometimes the the eggs don't hatch, and if they do hatch, they'll die within two three days after hatching because they're they're infected. So I give it to them a month before, and I give it to them uh, when the season is over in September. And clean them out again for the winter. But I, um, I want to tell you that uh, when you use that all-in-one or five-in-one, it has levomesal worm medication in it. But you always worm your bird twice because when you give them the worm medication once, you, ha- you haven't killed the eggs. So... About 10 days later, you're going to have a lot of juvenile worms that are hatching, and you want to come back and you want to kill those too. So you're supposed to give them, when you give them anything with a worm medication, 10 to 12 days later, you give them another worm medication, preferably of different kind, so so you're not building resistance and you, uh, you, you, know, you catch what's hatched since the first time. And then they'll, they'll slowly reinfect over the year, but uh, it's at low levels. So after your first five-day, five-in-one treatment, do you follow up then with something else in another five days? In the ten days. Oh, okay. Ten to twelve days. Yeah, you give them, um, like I said, one of those, one of those that I mentioned, the uh, Safeguard, Alvacin, um, Ivermectin, uh, Oxfendazole, uh, any number of them, but uh, I use the ones you put in the water because it's, they're they're easier to give and you give them for like three days and then you're then you're okay. You follow up uh, the the all in one treatment. So Ten to twelve days later, you give that other medication for three days and then then you finish for a while. And then these medications, I assume, would be more. Um appropriate for peafowl again like we talked because they're not a bird that's going to end up being consumed later by humans so some of these medications that you talk about probably shouldn't be used for other other poultry some of them don't have what they call an egg withdrawal or a period of time after the medication where you have to wait for the residuals to reduce in the chicken and the eggs some of them don't, don't have one ivermectin and safeguard is one of them and some of them, like ronitazole or metronidazole, uh, if you're concerned about that, you can wait uh, uh, five days. And ronitazole, I know, especially I've read that uh, within five days, the the levels of ronitazole were reduced to where they're undetectable. So if you're if you're worried about residuals in, in other in other poultry, uh, five day withdrawal is okay. You can hard boil the eggs and feed them to eggs and cats. Or just mix it in with their with their feed. So is it safe to say that if you have a bird that's sick, within reason, it doesn't really matter, and that might not be the best phrase to put it, but that if your bird's sick, that they should just get the five and one right off the bat? If they're drinking normally. Right, yeah, if, they, right. if they're drinking normally enough to, to take it up. Now, one thing you can do if they're not drinking normally, you can mix uh, an eighth of a teaspoon of powder with five cc's of water and uh, mix that up and then and, uh, use a syringe without a needle, of course, and uh, inject it down the throat. And you can, there's some syringes 
really that are very suitable for that. Uh, but you just do it without a needle and go off to the side of the trachea. You want to make sure you don't shoot it down the trachea, and that's going to be the opening in the middle with the flap on it. You want to go off to the side and make sure you get it down the throat. One treatment of that, uh, that's usually enough to get them. If they're still eating, you can also mix, uh, you can dust the scrambled egg with some of that 5 at one along, along with whatever else you're doing, and the bird can hardly resist a scrambled egg. They'll, they'll eat that when they don't eat anything else. But uh, where the real trouble comes is if your bird has stopped eating and drinking. They're harder to treat. You can inject that medication, like I told you, with the syringe, or you can start shoving that metronidazole down them. If, if they stopped eating and drinking because of a respiratory infection, then you, you give them some antibiotic right away, that LA-200, three-quarters cc. A lot of people use Thailand 200, and I've recommended that in the past, two cc's of Thailand 200. But I recommend three cc's, three quarter cc of LA 200 because it stays at a therapeutic level in the blood for three days. So it's like you give one injection and it's working for three days, where the the Thailand may be 24 hours or or less. And for those that haven't um, given a bird an injection, that therapeutic level for three days is... is, uh... Sounds much better than, than trying to do every 24 hours yeah. because it's such a pain. It's better than trying to catch them and get three shots, you know, that's for sure. Let me tell you something about peacock feed. Uh, if you ask 100 people what they feed, they'll they'll come up with 100 <laughs> cockamamie home blends, you know. Uh, and it drives me nuts. And they have, somehow they think what they're blending up this and that at home uh, is somehow better nutritionally than what you get to feed meal, although they don't have a clue what the nutritional makeup of their blend is. And the taste is superior to what the PhD has formulated for the feed meal. You know, somehow they think that they're better than the nutritional experts at the feed meals. And I'm sure that places like Purina, they, play, they pay plenty to have to do a lot of research. <laughs> they're just not mixing this and that together and see how it works. So uh, peacocks will do just fine on laying pellets. And a lot of people say, oh, you know, it's a lot of calcium for those birds and it's hard on the kidneys. Well, you can feed them something in the off season and and, and just feed them the uh, laying pellets during the laying months. You get it started about a month before you expect the first egg. But they're so protein driven. They want to give high protein game bird feeds, 30%, 28%. They're so protein driven. And what none of them understand is protein is hard on the kidneys. If, if calcium is, protein is equally hard on the kidneys because your kidneys have to work to expel the excess protein that's in their system. Those game bird feeds, let me tell you what they're for. And Purina makes about four of them because it, uh, for different stages of a pheasant's um, a life cycle. They're for the release and shoot pheasants. You know, up north, they got probably five, 6,000 uh, ringneck pheasants that they're raising, and they, they throw them out, and then, then people come with their dogs and shotguns and shoot them. And so they naturally want to rush them through as fast as possible. So they have something called flight conditioner. Well, I've seen people say, you know, I give my bird, he got, I got him on flight conditioner. Well, flight conditioner is is uh, it's what you give a pheasant just before you're about to release them, it improves the, the feathers, make sure they've got all their feathers for flight, but it also uh, slims them down and reduces their weight so that they can get off the ground fast enough. So is, is this is this what you're after with a peacock? And, you know, you, so you have to ask yourself, you know, the, a peacock is not a turkey that you're rushing to the Thanksgiving table. You, you want that bird to grow off at, at a normal rate, and you, you don't want them to overgrow their legs and go lame. And you, you just don't want to puff them up like a turkey, so you, you just uh, you, you really don't need you really don't need that turkey feed and that high protein game bird feed. I, I've never had anybody explain to me exactly why you need the protein. I, a lot of people will say though that uh, well you have to grow out those feathers. Got to grow, and it's true. You know, peacocks got a job growing out some feathers, but at the same time. I switch my birds to a maintenance pellet every September at the end of August there in September, beginning of September. I switch them to a 12, sometimes 14% maintenance pellet, and they grow that tail out just fine. They they do it without being on uh, 28, 30% protein. And I see a lot of people also um, 
ask about feeding them cat food, I think, for the higher protein as well. You know, I, 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 I'm I going to tell you that uh, I'm one of those people that do that. <laughs> <laughs> During the laying season, okay, I go down to Tractor Supply, and they have a really cheap cat food called Multicat. It's 28% protein. And and I buy, you know, hundreds of pounds of that stuff and bring it home. And I fa- it's grain-based because it's a cheap cat food. It's got a lot of grain in it. It's a grain-based uh, cat food. And I found that it will boost the egg production by about 20%. You know, and uh, I, uh, I've i got uh, about 35 hens out here, so I'm, I'm naturally interested in uh maximizing the egg production. It's not like you have two or three hens and, and you're worried about how many eggs. I, I've got to have a volume of them to recover my cost. I've got to hatch out a volume of them. I do use that, but what you have to be careful is eventually possums and coons and cats in the neighborhood are going to find out what you're doing. <laughs> and they're going to find their way to your house. And they start coming up in broad daylight after a while, and uh, they don't care who sees them. So what kind of cages, I guess, since we are, like I said, recording this, I kind of know what you have going on at home because of the Facebook group that I'm on and from talking to you in the past. But can you maybe tell us more about what kind of birds you have and then what, like, how do you, how do you protect your birds from the, from the possums and stuff that come in to pick up the cat food? Well, this year I fed them something different and uh, I'm going to, it didn't get the same results. I'm going to have to go back to the cat food and at two or three of the neighborhood cats want to make this their home for, I guess I'm going to have to hope to catch enough mice to pay for it. <laughs> but uh, let me tell you the problem with feeding peacock. Nobody makes a peacock food. And uh, if you call a major food company, I, I mentioned Purina so often because they do a lot of research and you can call people and you can get answers, you know, when you call them, whereas you won't for a lot of feed brands. They don't make a peacock food. And so you just have to guess at uh, which is going to help your birds the most. Like I said, I, I do feed them that, that uh, cheap cat food during the uh, during the laying season because they, they do so well on it. They do better than they, they do. I tell you what, I, f- I fed them laying pellets and check the egg count. I fed them the Purina Game Bird Breeder, which is 20% protein. And they make all they make a whole pocket full of claims like you're going to get more eggs, you're going to get a better egg. You go to chicks, more chicks are going to hatch, more chicks are going to live, and they go on and on. And I fed them that for a year, and I couldn't tell any difference between that and late pellets. And then I went to the cat food, and uh, it does the egg count and uh, and the hatch rate, too. I do better with that, but but only because it's a grain-based, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, food. And you said that was called multi-cat? If they, if they make multi-cat, yeah. It works out to be about 50 cents a pound. It's higher than feeding chicken feed, but, you know, if you don't... If you, if you don't get the eggs and you don't hatch the chicks, that costs money too. You know, I got a I got a, a feed bill that's pretty good size, and I got to recover. Got to hatch enough <laughs> to recover my feed bill. Yeah, I, I know that struggle. <laughs> yeah, brought my wife a uh, three Rios this year. I had ostrich for thirty years, and they all got old and died. And she kept bugging me about getting another one. <laughs> so I said, "Look, I'm seventy four years old. I, I, I'm not. I don't have any business out there trying to manhandle those birds." And and uh, I said, "You know, I mess around out there and get hurt." So I put her off like that for a while, and then finally I, I was looking at some Rhea. Have you seen a Rhea bird? I have. So I told her, "I said, uh, I'm gonna get you some miniature ostrich." I showed her a picture once. Oh. I'm gonna get you some miniature ostrich. <laughs> 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 and she loved them. She loves them. <laughs> Now, they're nasty enough during the mating season, but uh, I had some back in the early 80s. Anyway, I'm just kind of kind of sweating how much they're going to be eating. I know they're going to add to I'm going to add to the feed deal. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> she got her miniature ostrich out there now. You know, I've never actually seen one in, in person, of course, with the Internet. You see all kinds of stuff. But um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. are they pretty popular in your area? Because I don't know of anybody up here in Colorado that has them. I got into ostrich kind of by accident in the 80s, and uh, they were up breeding age right when the big craze hit in the early 90s. You're familiar with that breeding craze here in the U.S.? Yep. Our neighbors, when I was a kid, had ostriches. Oh, they got enormous amounts of money from the age back then. And then when people got the prices of ostrich kind of where the ordinary person couldn't afford it at all, more than a car. And, of course, when the market just totally collapsed on the on the island, and the emu and Rhea did too, but it's coming back for the emu and Rhea and the ostrich. Although I don't know what anybody does with an ostrich any, but uh, it's it's coming back. Some interest coming back in them, but it'll never be like it was. But uh, 
the thing about the uh, the rhea is is that uh, they're they're a real hardy bird, and there's a population of them got off a farm in Germany, and in two or three spots, but particularly in one spot in Germany. And they said there was about 16 of them in the year 2000, and now there's like uh, two, 300 of them. And they're just multiplying more every year because they survive on their own, where I don't think an emu will. They survive on their own. You know how cold it is up there. And uh, Germany's kind of up north there. You know, it's so parallel with London and maybe New York. Yeah. So these, these populations are growing. And the thing about it is, I don't know how or why, but the German government uh, protects them. They said, well, you know, they're here, and they're indigenous now, and uh, you can't go out and kill them. So I don't know what's going to happen. Those populations grow and grow and grow and grow. We've had that happen with peacocks. There's a couple of uh, places. A guy who wasn't right here in my little town, 7,000 people. There's There's a guy who moved off to Canada and left his peacocks behind. They were out in the woods around his house. You know, he didn't have them pinned. And they're still there today. I guess he's been gone at least. 20, 30 years, and the peacocks are, are still there, and some of the neighbors feed them. Wow. It's a feral flock, and there's a couple of them in Houston, and then you read about more of them in California. And so, uh, you know, what you find in some of these places is that half the people in town are feeding them out the back door, and the other half wants to shoot them <laughs> because, you know, they're noisy, and they jump on your cars. And they literally, I've seen them on TV, they go out in the street and stop traffic. Oh, no. So who knows what the, who knows what kind of problem the Rio is going to be. Sure. I've seen some people where they just keep them on a ranch and they're, they're not fit. Just uh, got them out there. And they don't, if you feed them a little bit every now and then, they're not going to go too far from, from where, uh, where you feed them. They feed them supplement in the winter, especially. You've seen that sometimes too, where, where you get an animal that's uh, invasive and they, they just kind of take over. But the, the the peacocks are rather harmless as far as an invasive species, but some other animals are not, like the pythons down in Florida. You know, once they get out of control there in that swamp, they'll eat everything in sight. Yeah, I know those are Birds, becoming a huge eggs. problem. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know what's going. I don't know what the future of the Everglades are because there's no way to keep them from from getting in there and there's a lots of trouble in the future. Mm-hmm. I know that they've started doing um, some more eradication, but it might be a little too little too late. How do you find them, you know? Yeah. Can you even find those things? You know how big the Everglades are? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and you're going to... How do you how do you find them? So, I don't know what the, the end of that story is going to be. We're just at the beginning of it. Yep, it, uh, it'll be an interesting one to watch, that's for sure. Well, I told you, I think earlier... Um, that there's 125 different colors and uh, color patterns of peacocks. And then there's the Java green from India and Ceylon and that part of the world. But the greenest one is the Java green. And that's one uh, that people keep here in the U.S. You mix those. A lot of people, you know, breed those in. But they, they don't breed true. Oh, you, you get a hybrid but and then reproduce, but you can't reproduce the same thing as the parents. They just, uh, like you cross a, a Java green with the India blue. The chicks will be one thing, but then when those chicks... Or, or, or bread, they, they won't look uh, 100% like the parents. They get diluted down mm-hmm. each generation. Well, let me tell you about the, the Java green. I talked to a guy one time. I think he was in Indonesia. I was sending me- exchange of messages with him. And he says, uh, you can, it came up that you could get a Java green egg for $5. I said, oh, wow. I just really wouldn't get that here, the Java green egg. He said, oh, well, they're so common up here. And then he made the he made the remark that they were protected up there by the government. Mm. And so you really couldn't keep them in captivity. But he said you can hear them calling from all over the hood. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's got one. The good thing about peacocks are there are probably more in captivity than there are in the wild for the simple fact that they reproduce so well in captivity. And, so, and sadly, though, you can say the same thing about uh, big cats like the Bengal. Sure. Uh, there's infinitely more of them in captivity than there are in the wild. There's, we're down to 500 or less in the wild. But anybody that wants bangles and you got an enclosure, you can buy some and start raising them. Yes, you can. Maybe I'm in the wrong line of work with peafowl. Maybe <laughs> maybe bangles are where it's at. Yeah. I dreamed about some kind of house cat the other day from, uh, I think it was Indonesia again. They got some kind of house cat to get a $1,000 a piece for. And uh, you could tell it was a different kind of cat. But the only problem with those kinds, and especially with the uh, those, uh, what they call bangle, I call them bangle too, but they're a spotted cat and they, they're, they're yeah. extended with big cats. Mm-hmm. You don't want to turn one of them loose in your house. Oh, no. Because uh, that thing will be all, a lot of the subject being all over the place. They, 
they're never really 100% domesticated. And you've got to run them through about three generations before they settle down and act like a normal. you got to keep breeding them with uh, house cats for about three generations before they settle down. But uh, why people want those things, gosh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I knew somebody with one, and um, it uh, was an adventure, to say the least. Oh, I'll bet. I'm just not a big fan of keeping thing in, things in cages, and that's what you have to do when you raise those kind of cats. You have to build pens outside, and I'm just not a big fan of pinning animals up for life. You know, mm-hmm. uh, well, The way I keep peacocks here is I've got a two-acre pen with a five-foot fence, and if you raise your – in the barns, the barns are inside of it. If you raise your uh, peacocks inside of the fence, they got little – especially if it's a lot of space, like a couple of acres – They don't have a sense of confinement, and they have very little desire to get out. And so as a result, you know, two or three, four or five of mine may get out and walk around in the yard during the day, but I've got 80 of them out here, and they all all stay inside the fence. And so um, what I'm saying is that uh, they're they're not really pinned because there's so much space, and uh, I'm not just a, a big fan of just building, you know, a great big cage and keeping animals in it. Like I told my wife, just don't want to be the warden of a little tiny prison. Yeah, that's, yeah. I know I've seen your pictures on the group, and I was going to ask you that, um, but you kind of alluded to it earlier. Even if they were to get outside of the fence, I guess because you take such good care of them, and they know that there's food and stuff there, they don't they don't just take off and and disappear. Uh, no, uh, they used to lay outside the fence a lot, but uh, I had two egg eating dogs many years ago, and I found out when they all got old and died that. Uh, Peacocks started laying back inside the fence again, and so they lay in the barns and inside the fence, and uh, and they just they just don't go outside the fence to lay, and and they uh, they they stay inside the fence real good for me, and and it helps that I don't have any close neighbors that they they don't uh, get under the window at night and scream and jump on their cars and that kind of thing. They they stay here. If there's a dog that ever comes in the neighborhood, they go flying back in the pen. If they're outside, they know. And if they're too far from the pen, they get up on the roof of the house or in the trees. They they know what to do. So do you have 80 birds total or 80 males? Because I remember you said you had 35 or so females. No, I, I've got 80 total, and uh, I keep adding hens, but somehow it uh, it always works out to be a split, about 50-50 hens and males. And, uh, but uh, I, add, I make sure that I add hens to the flock every year. I don't know for whatever reason, but hens just don't seem to last as long as the males. They, they, their lifespan doesn't seem to be as long. And, and I, I hear people say, they ask, well, how long does a peacock live? And it, it gets... I, I, unbelievable what I what I read the responses. You know, some of them say, "Oh, well, you know, they heard of somebody had one over fifty years old." I'm gonna tell you, twenty years is a long time for any kind of barnyard bird. It's a goose, a chicken, or anything else, a chicken especially, but a goose. Goose can live twenty, twenty one years, but I just don't see a peacock living thirty, forty, fifty years. Mm-hmm. The, the longest mine I've lived has been about twenty to twenty one years. Oh wow! And like I said, that's that's a long time for a bird. Yeah, especially like you said, an outdoor barnyard bird. Do you have any issues with the males? I mean, two acres is a large area, but at the same time, having that many males, do they tend to get along pretty well? Let me tell you, this year, I I really didn't notice them fighting at all. My wife said they did, but usually in the spring for a couple of weeks, some of them will flare up at each other. I guess they're testing the order of dominance to see if it changed since last season. But uh, some of them will flare up at each other and... After a couple of weeks, it's all over and and they're okay. But they don't they don't roost together. I noticed that during the season they'll scatter out and roost. Uh, they're not really buddies during the season when it comes <laughs> roosting time. They scatter. Out. Let me tell you another thing that's helped me is that uh, I can't keep a dog back there with them because those those birds are just deathly afraid of a dog. But I took a hot wire and connected it to a fence charger and I ran that wire about eight inches off the ground all the way around the whole two acres. And I'm going to tell you, it worked like magic. I was I had a plague of coons coming in here and possums, and dogs started digging out. I never had those troubles in the old days. You know, I've been right here on this place raising peacocks for 45 years, and, and I, I imagine I went 30 of it with no trouble at all. But I, I put that wire up there and connected it to a fence charger. It worked like magic to, to keep everything out of here. And the dogs don't even, I live on a little short dead-end road, 
and the dogs don't even come down into my down my street anymore. I guess one or two of them got into it, and <laughs> decided that wasn't for them. Yeah. But if the fence charger is a, they're not expensive to run or expensive to buy. And I thought there was going to be a lot of maintenance to it, but there's not. That's the way I deal with stuff digging in. I hadn't had anything dig in since I put it up years ago. That's a good idea. I live on two acres, and so our back is probably about an acre that I have for for the birds. And I, and I keep my chickens and my peafowl and my ducks and everybody separate in their own. So I have multiple little pins, but we have a big issue with coyotes and stuff. And I like that idea of the hot wire because it's so expensive to try to fence, you know, such a large area in a way that can keep out predators. But that sounds like it's a pretty effective and, and cost-effective method as well. Yeah, I, I got the five-foot chain leak nailed on the wooden post. It's hard to keep anything from digging under, you know, but like I said, you put that about eight inches off the ground and there's no way they can start digging without getting their face in, you know, without uh, sticking their the nose in that wire. Sure. And it, it'll, it'll sure, uh, it'll sure make them jump back, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Because so I got into it two or three times myself oh. <laughs> while I was working on it <laughs> and uh, it made me jump back. <laughs> so, you know, it's a 30 or 40 pound dog. I imagine it really go through them pretty good, pretty, st- oh, sure. pretty strong. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Not anything if you get into it, you let go of it right away. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So do you have any advice from your years of experience if somebody wanted to get into PFAL and they don't really have a lot of experience, what would you tell somebody that wants to get started? Well, first of all, you got to have a good enclosure or pen and just don't bring them home. You know, I used to have people call me, I'd, I'd advertise, not not on Facebook, just in a local advertiser. And people have the impression that they live up in the city and they're going to bring that, it, you know, it's illegal to keep poultry in a city, especially one that screams six months out of the year, <laughs> like Peacock does. And uh, they think that the uh, They've got a four-foot chain-link fence, and they think they just bring it home, throw it out in the backyard. They don't have any shelter for it. They don't have adequate fencing. A you know, four-foot fence, uh, even a dog can jump over that, a good-sized dog. So they, they don't have a good setup to bring one home to. And then once they get home, they're not well-versed in peacock problems. Like they're they're not well-versed in the medications you need to keep on, home, on hand. Here's the thing about it. Every animal on a farm has to be medicated. I don't care if it's a goat, a pig, a horse, a cow, or what it is. But somehow they think the peacocks don't need anything. So they don't keep worm medications or antibiotics or, or uh, like the five-in-one or all-in-one. They don't, they don't keep medications. And then they only, a lot of times they only contact me when the bird is laying comatose on the pen floor and want to know what to do. And they don't have any medications, and especially if the medication, some of them have to be ordered online. Uh, that bird's not going to be able to wait on the mail. So they're just not set up for them. So if, if you don't have a coop and you don't have a pen and you don't have a, you're not, you're not versed at all with, with medications, uh, uh, you need to do a little research before you bring some home. And which medications do you recommend having on hand? At a minimum, you got to have that all in one pigeon medication. You've got to have a good worm medication, and you have to have a bottle of antibiotics because when your bird starts going down, you have to treat them right now because the bird is only going to die of about two or three things. They're going to have a respiratory infection. They're going to have a protozoan infection, and it's going to be compounded by overload of worms. There's only about three different things that will kill a bird, and those are, that's them. So you have to have something for those. Now, let me tell you about chickens. Chickens are more resistant to coccidiosis and blackhead and, and can carry a whole lot of worms without any problem. So chickens kind of thrive on neglect. A lot of people keep chickens. They don't do anything for them, and the chickens survive. So when they get peacocks, they say, well, they're not really impressed with what really need to do for peacocks. So they think they can just keep them like chickens. But chickens are worm and germ factories when it comes to peacock and turkey. They carry a lot of stuff. It's very harmful to peacocks and turkeys, but they're resistant to it. So they go around shedding worms, carrying protozoans, and uh, especially blackhead, which is a parasite on a worm. And uh, they just really not. A, and then they want to, you know, why are my birds dying? I just can't keep my birds alive. And I said, well, you, you got to eat worms, medication, you worm them. You, you, you gotta, or they say, well, my bird, he's just really gargling when he breathes. I said, okay, what kind of antibiotic do you have? Because, you know, you can use different antibiotics as penicillin and, and as well as pilin and um, um, LA-200 and 
maybe one or two more in different dosages. We can use them. And sometimes they'll say, well, I got penicillin, I keep from auto. Are you give them this much? And uh, some of them say, well, no, I, I don't have any. But on the store on Monday, I'll go down to the feed store, and you know, it's Friday night. Well, that bird won't be alive on Monday because once a bird gets sick, he's dying. Dying a little bit every hour. So you got to turn that clock back. A lot of times, uh, let me tell you one about feeding a peacock. I'll, they'll say, I'll find out their, their bird is egg bound. A bird is egg bound that they can't, they have an egg they can't lay. They're egg bound because they're feeding a calcium, a, a diet with, which lacks calcium. Because believe it or not, calcium, if your calcium level gets too low, the muscles of a bird will lose strength and they can't expel the egg. So they're stuck there with it, and the eggs are backing up. So you tell them, you know what you tell them? You tell them, go get some tums, break them out, and poke a couple of tums down their throat, and they'll lay that egg in, in anywhere from one to two to three hours, and it'll all be over because the, the tums are loaded with calcium. Mm. But I say, what are you feeding? Well, we mostly you come up there feeding mm. scratch grain, and scratch grain is just about like has a nutritional value of pea gravel. <laughs> it just doesn't have the vitamins and especially the calcium that a bird needs to function normally. So people bring these birds home, and but they want to feed them that scratch grain because it's grain, you know, and it seems like it's wholesome and it's natural and it's grain, but it's it's depleted grain. It just doesn't really have any nutritional value, and it tells you on the bag mm -hmm. it shouldn't be considered a complete diet for anything. So. A lot of people, they're just not versed about how to care for a bird, and their, their enclosures are not real good, to, especially to keep predators out, and uh, and they're not well versed on how to feed them. I was kind of in that new person scenario that you kind of described there. We have a family friend that has the, the peafowl, and my husband, as an anniversary gift, one day came home with some peafowl eggs, and I mm -hmm. was not ready <laughs> that at all so you know i had about a month of well, however long that they were in the incubator there for to panic and get everything set up and and i've been through a lot of those challenges that you mentioned because i'm used to chickens and so i figured you know they're they're going to be pretty hardy and you know it's pretty easy to take care of them all you need to do is feed them and water them right and and they'll, they'll be good to go mm -hmm. but fortunately i haven't had too many health concerns because i was able to find your group early and take the proper care of them and, and do the homework. But yeah, I think a lot of people just assume it's just like anything else or, you know, just like a chicken and they're definitely a little bit more labor intensive, but it's certainly worth it. Anything, here's, here's, I don't care if it's a plant or an animal, anything that's beautiful, is not going to reproduce well and it's harder to make it live, whether it's a peacock or an orchid or anything else. So have you ever thought about that? Anything really it's just like when you grow vegetables, you know, the weeds don't need any help at all. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> the, <laughs> so anything special is going to require some something. It's funny you should say that because I grew orchids. I, uh, I still do grow orchids too. And, and that's a great analogy because they are impossibly difficult sometimes. But, but again, it's very much worth it. Yeah. Yeah. But you just have to sit around for a long time and wait on them though, don't you? <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> And wonder if they're ever going to bloom again. Because once you get them out of that greenhouse, uh, they're reluctant to put on uh, as many blooms as they did inside the greenhouse. Of course. Once you bring them home, they, you really have to coax them to bloom. Yep. But uh, I, I don't know how modest this is of me. Uh, uh, I'm sure it's immodest to say. But I, I swear, I don't know how people kept their peacocks alive before I, I uh, opened the group up and, and started, uh, you know, telling people what they're going to have to do because, you know, peacocks are just, again, like turkeys, they're not unique in themselves in this regard that they, they just will drop dead on you if you're not careful with them. And I had to do research that went back way to the darkest corners of the Internet, get bits and pieces and put it together like you would a mosaic. It's kind of like one of those thousand-piece puzzles where, you know, at least 600 of the pieces look the same. <laughs> yeah. You how they all fit together. And so... I had to go back and get all all the the old 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 uh, information from way back and piece it together to figure out what used to be done at one time, but but nowadays uh, the internet. Uh, if you look uh, if you look on the internet, and they'll say, well, you know, turkeys get blackheads. Sometimes ninety percent of the flock die from blackhead, and if so, there's there's no treatment for blackhead. Well, that's not true. There's no government approved treatment for blackhead, but there is a treatment. You know, metronidazole is one of them, and ronidazole, and a couple of others. Uh, but they, they, their vets cannot 
prescribe that for you if for an animal that's going to be part of the food supply. But those same medications, they treat dogs and cats with them, and even humans take them. You know, you get protozoans in, in your in your system. Sometimes a doctor will prescribe metronidazole for you. But it, it just built up too much in the food supply. And like I told you earlier, it's coming at you every day, every meal from all directions. And they decided that wasn't the healthiest thing in the world. In regards to your previous topic, I don't think that that's unmodest of you at all because I've had my, my PFAL now for, I guess, three years. And I've seen you have saved so many lives of so many birds. And and again, you've <laughs> helped me. And, and I know I'm personally grateful for you. And, and I know that there's hundreds of people if not more thousands that that you you truly have saved their birds lives and and I think what your your group and what you have going on and and you're sharing your knowledge and and I don't know how you keep up with all of the people that have questions for you but um you have been well, instrumental. Like I said, I, I'm an I'm an old man with too much time and too little to do so uh, <laughs> if I didn't have the group I don't know what I'd be doing but uh you're right. You know, some some of these group members, they'll contact me, and the bird is dying, and I'll give them something to do. And they sound, they, they sound so relieved that now they can do something, you know, besides just sit there and stare at their bird that's dying every hour. And we don't save all the birds, but we save a lot of them. And it's... Uh, it's it's just hard to figure out if you go on the internet and try to do research you're not you're not going to be able to sort it all out like I said it took you don't know how many hours and hours and hours and hours one time I spent three days straight every all day long you know three days at one one particular city trying to sort out all the information so you, the ordinary person's not going to be able to, to you know to find it and to piece it all together but but at the same time it's got, I tell people it's like riding a bike. Once you learn what to do, you wonder how it could have been so hard. Isn't yep. that the way it is with a bike? Once, <laughs> yeah. once you learn how, you wonder how it could have been so hard. And uh, it's that way with learning how to take care of a peacock. Um, once you learn a few basic things, uh, you wonder if it's been so hard. Yeah, you look back and think it's so silly, and, and all you got to do is this, this, and this, and then they'll be just fine. The methods that we practice in the group... I'm beginning to gain some traction because fewer people are contacting me and saying, well, you know, the bird's passed out on the pen floor. What will I do? I don't get so many of those anymore. <laughs> but learning to, to get medications, keep medication. And, and birds are not, I tell you, peacocks are not sickly. They don't say sick all the time. But when they do have, you got to be ready to go. Mm -hmm. What would you say is the most common question that you're asked on the group? Well, a lot of them want to talk to me about sinus infections, that their bird's eye is all swelled up or it's they're got this puffy place right, you know, below the beak and uh, it's swelling up on them. And when they get that big swelling up under the eye, you know, sometimes you let that go. That's a real problem because... It's hard to describe without seeing a picture or a video, but you, you've got to do a little bit of surgery on cutting. It, it builds up a, a mass there that has to be cut, and the, the, the antibiotics will get rid of the sinus, but that lump that's under the eye, you got to take an exacto knife and make you a semicircle under there and, and push that lump out. Now, it heals up real quick. You don't have to stitch it or anything, but you do have to get some antibiotics along with it. The swelling in the face is, is pretty common, especially in the late summer when it's really dry. And it, because uh, one, one of the larger breeders that's pretty knowledgeable about this, uh, he says that it comes from dust, you know, the dust bathing and scattering dust. And he thinks the, the infections get started that way. And then, uh, and then a lot of them... Uh, uh, will tell you, you know, my bird's got diarrhea. And I said, okay, does it have any red or yellow in it? Because you get a bird with yellow and the diarrhea, it's blood and they got coccidiosis. And if it's yellow and the diarrhea, they've got blackhead. And so most cases, diarrhea is going to be worms. are going to be evidence of a protozoan infection. It's going to be symptomatic of it. So the, the respiratory infections, not breathing right, or the head swelling or the or, or some treatment for protozoan infections are pretty pretty common, ongoing. It seems like you know, we've talked a lot about the protozoan infections. How do they become infected? You know, um, I believe that uh, they've been here with us for so long, way more than 100 years. And who knows how, how, how far in the past, coccidiosis especially, who knows how many centuries or thousands of years that it's been carried forward. 
But I'm with the thinking that every barnyard bird in, bird in America has got some level of coccidiosis and blackheads and worms because there's just no way to escape it. If some people would say, well, I've got new ground, you know, uh, my birds are not pecking it up. Uh, you know, if birds poop on the ground and persist of the, from the uh, blackhead, especially, of getting in the soil, they can stay two or three years in the soil. So when the chicken comes along, peck and scratch grain or whatever off the ground, they'll pick it up. So it, they'll say, well, you know, I'm, I'm on new ground. Uh, I don't have any of that in my soil. Well, but it's in birds that you're bringing into that new ground. So the new ground doesn't stay new very long. So I'm, I'm with the vegan. I don't know how any bird, you know, a chick picks that up so quick when they're born. Uh, I don't know how any bird could not have, so any adult bird could not have some level of protozoans or worms in it. So it's mostly from the soil then? Well, there's there's intermediary host too uh, for blackhead and coccidiosis. Uh, blackhead especially, uh, if they poop and then an earthworm gets into it and digests some of it, then, then these these protozoans stay alive inside the earthworm, and then the bird will come along and eat the earthworm, or it gets in insects, slugs especially. And so there's those uh, intermediate host, or else they can transfer it directly from one to the other. So really, I mean, the only way to keep them from a protozoan infection would be keep them in a concrete barn, completely secluded from every you know trace of dirt and and any other potentially infected bird it sounds like yeah <laughs> and who does that right <laughs> <laughs> yeah so the um like i said that luckily they can tolerate they can tolerate all three of those ones and protozoans to uh, blackhead and coccidiosis they can tolerate those at low levels but some birds in the flock will will get down with it and some won't because somehow are overwhelmed their systems are overwhelmed with it for one reason or another especially if they get a respiratory infection and the next thing you know their immune system is compromised and everything has free reign to multiply and increase everything bad in their system but you need to feed medicated feed you know, I, I hear the craziest things people tell me. Don't feed medicated feed. And I think some of that, I think what that comes from was many years ago, some of the feed companies experimented with putting a, a very a trace element of arsenic in the starter feeds to uh, to kill some of the protozoans and gut bacteria. You know, the uh, I'll tell you about the gut bacteria in a minute, but some of that would kill they said it was especially was uh, the arsenic was hard on ducks. So they got the idea that uh, starter feeds kill chicks. But you need a, a medicated starter feed. And the easiest one to get, depends on what part of the country you're in, but the one that you can get access to everywhere is the uh, Purina medicated. Now, they make an unmedicated, but you want the medicated start and grow in the red bag. And you've got to feed them that till they're about four months old because it takes uh, – it takes 12 to 14 weeks for their immune system to develop, to get their full resistance to, uh, to coccidiosis, which which is uh, what they're medicated against in the starter. And it takes that long for I can't do. That's why I tell them you got to keep them up on wire in a coop till they're three to four months old before you let them out. And and, and a peacock's resistance is never going to be as good as a as a as chickens. Their immune resistance. Uh, I call it resistance rather than immunity because they're not immune. They're just they have a resistance, and so you you're gonna to have to keep feeding that medicated food and keep them off the off the. Oh, well, I have people tell me, oh yeah, I raise mine with chickens, and my mama hen raises the pea chicks just fine right there on the ground, running around the yard. But what I found is, uh, my personal experience, I had other people tell me this: whenever you leave half dozen chicks with a with a hen, one by one, you're gonna find their one missing or once drowned in the water container, in the water bucket, or something has happened to them one by one until they're all gone. So I, I never think it's a good idea just to live with hens right there on that ground. It was just got to be infected with something, you know, in a barnyard and uh, and you live with a hen among chicken snakes and everything else. And, and expect to have, if you have start out with half a dozen chicks, don't expect to have a half a dozen adult birds one day. Yeah, that. That absolutely makes sense. I was going to ask you that too. That's one thing I've always wondered about is I've heard and when I hatched mine, I, I kept them off the ground. But like you talked about, you know, the pea chicks that hatch under mama, they're they're out running around. But yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, they're just, they're just not going to do as well. And they, they need to, uh, they just need protection from predators and parasites and everything else. And 
uh, they said they're just a little more delicate than uh, than chicken, chicken chick over Guinea. I, I had some Guinea one year, many years ago, back in the 70s. You know, they start running. I mean, you can only catch their fruity little rascals. <laughs> you know, they, they're slow to come along. Yep. So I'm not sure you totally have the floor, and I'm not trying to change the subject at all. And if you have more to talk about the PFAL, I'm absolutely more than open with that. But I know that when we talked earlier, you also mentioned that you had some of your uh, thoughts about education and debt and stuff. And I didn't know if maybe you wanted to talk about that any. Oh, yeah. I, I, let me tell you about that. <laughs> you know, I went to college. <laughs> I went to college in the 60s and I borrowed money to do it. And it was sort of common back in that time to, to borrow money. Uh, that uh, I felt like I was the only one doing it. Everybody else's parents somehow had money to pay, and uh, I qualified as an indigent adult. I trained in the uh, down here at Lamar University in Beaumont. They have a, a vocational section where they a trade school, and uh, I had uh, trained down there to be a diesel mechanic. And it didn't take me long to figure out that uh, that's not where where I needed to be. Because one thing, it just couldn't make any money, you know. Mm-hmm. I'd lived while I was going down there for two years in a two year program. I lived uh, in the crew quarters of uh, of a funeral home, and uh, of course, you know, I'd make ambulance calls and work funerals with him. And uh, the guy wasn't doing enough business to pay me anything, but he let me live there for free. So I thought that was good. <laughs> so I worked for worked for him for free. And so I thought, well, maybe I don't want to be a mechanic. Maybe I'll be a uh, mortician. Mm-hmm. So I went to this mortician school, and there was a guy who was had a, a, a you know well known reputation. He had had that private school there, and he was also a lawyer. And uh, I, I I don't know how those go together, but uh, <laughs> being a, a, a Mortician and a lawyer. It kind of reminds me of a story. A man was going through the cemetery with his son, and he was just learning how to read, the boy was. So he read tombstones. So he asked his daddy, he said, Daddy, what does this one say here? And he says, Here lies a lawyer and an honest man. The boy very pensively looked at that for a moment and he said, Don't look like there's room enough for two people down there. <laughs> So anyway, when we showed up in September, he was in a wheelchair and he had cancer. And so he didn't, wasn't able to do any teaching. He died right after that. It wasn't too many months later until the school burnt down. There were some oh, suspicious no. circumstances under, under which it burnt down. They thought it was arson and they thought one of the students did it, but uh, who knows. And so there I was, you know, I, I, I was a decent mechanic. I didn't want to be a decent mechanic. And I got, I, I literally got burned out, you know, of the, of the, being a mortician. So I came back and started at the University of Lamar. And, and by that time, I was over 21, so I qualified for the loan as an indigent adult. Uh, and uh, because uh, I had, uh, I, I didn't make hardly any money the year before. And they didn't use my dad's income. So I, I borrowed, you know, all, the maximum that they loaned me every year. And I, and I went to school, believe it or not, I went to school 12 months out of the year at Lamar University for 63 months. That's, you know, that's uh, like five years and three mm-hmm. months. So I, I had a pretty good bill. By the time I got out of there, it was uh, around $6,000, which was why well, I started teaching school. And that was one year's beginning teacher pay in this little rural area I live in. Mm-hmm. And now, one year is beginning teacher pay. I'm, I'm sure it's better other places, about 32000 And uh, that's about what you'd need to get through college again. Mm-hmm. But here's the thing about it. I worked, and my wife worked and the, the whole time, you know. And uh, we borrowed money, and uh, we tried to put some kind of limit uh, on our uh, living expenses. But what, what happens today is people get those college loans and they get sucked into these for-profit institutions like Kaplan or ITT or some of the others. And I think they've gone broke since then and they, they get sucked in there and they, they charge a lot of tuition. They think somehow there's a shortcut to education. So they roll them up about how they're going to uh, train them and all the money they're going to get when they get out of there. And what they find out is that if they do finish, they can't get a job in their field. And a lot of times they'll drop out and then they find out that they they can't get a job and they owe lots of money. And it's uh, others, they go off to a four-year institution like, uh, like a university. They don't make any effort to limit their expenses. They'll go off. They'll stay in the dorms. They don't do any work. They don't try to work and make any kind of money. And they allow them to borrow so much now. And so when they get out, they owe, they have fifty, sixty thousand in debt. And you have to borrow money to go, but you have to borrow so much 
that it's uh, crippling and, 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 and not make it, can't you just, let me tell you about community colleges, and, and people may not realize this. Community colleges, you, you can get a degree at a community college, a two-year associate degree, and you can go on to a four-year institution where you can't do that with these for-profit companies like mm-hmm. ITT and Kaplan, and there's others, I just, the names don't come to mind. But but there there is a, a progression when you go to a, a, a accredited university. And uh, if you, community colleges, I'd say here's the part that I don't think really people understand. The tuition is at least 50%. You can, you can go, you can go to those places in two years, they'll treat you a skill and put you to work and uh, you can move on or you can go on and, and finish a four year degree. But the time you're there, that is thousand twelve hundred dollars a semester. Where it's five thousand for tuition at a at a, uh, at a state run uh, university. So why everybody doesn't do their first two years at the local community college? I don't know. I couldn't agree more. And like I said, you you can uh, you can uh, you can go onto the main campus of a university and transfer, if not all the credits, a, a huge slug of them. And so you you have a skill and you go get you a degree and you you find yourself not only more employable but promotable. And you'll be very successful in whatever whatever your occupation is. But the worst thing you could do, here's the very worst thing you can do. Go borrow a slug of money. Don't try to minimize your expenses. Go borrow a slug of money. Get you a degree in English grammar or American history. And then go out and try to get a job. You know, not too many people need a, a performing arts major. They don't need somebody to play the guitar or draw them a picture. And they don't need somebody to correct their grammar. They need somebody that can put their hands on the work and make it go. Yep. The worst thing you can do is get your liberal arts degree and owe fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, I, you know, at the I end feel of, like a lot of cases that that's the case. I'm a paramedic, so that's kind of something that I needed to go to school for. But um, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of those I, I never realized until recently, actually, when I started listening and following a gentleman by the name of Grant Cardone, and he does some kind of entrepreneurship and finances and just kind of how to get things like that in order and. It just never dawned on me that the education system in a lot of cases really is for profit. You know, it's pushed on you. You have to have a degree and your parents say you have to go to school. But I'm not so sure that that's really a necessity. You can get work, but you just won't be promotable. Mm-hmm. And and let me tell you something else. I, I taught school for 31 years, so I, I can tell you about public education. Only about 20% of the people understand what the, the students in, in schools, and especially high school, only about 20% of them understand what they're there for. The rest of them are just passing through like an apricot seed. They're completely untouched by it when they get through. And, and they go from kindergarten to the 12th grade. When they get to 12th grade, they still can't read and write or multiply single-digit numbers in their head. You know, they got to be scratching for the calculator. And the school system just keep pushing them on. And the teachers say, no, this this student this student can't read and write. They didn't do my work. They didn't come to school. They refused to do the work. They slept every day. Well, when it comes to graduation time, you got to sweep them all out the door mm-hmm. or else the parents and the principal is going to be all over you. Yep. So they, they graduate uh, a high school diploma is just not doesn't really mean anything other than you have a pulse you know and these tests that they give like in texas especially these skills tests to, to, that you have to pass in order to graduate they're really based on about an eighth grade education and and then a lot of them have a hard time passing that you just can't make students responsible for anything and and in my generation i came up through school in the 50s and early 60s parents expected they, you know, my dad never went to high school, and at, at that time, 1960, there was uh, a full 50 percent of the adult population could not even read and write. Their educations had been disrupted by the Great Depression and the World War II. Being raised like my dad out in an area where there was not, there was there was no high school, and and good gosh, what did he learn in that elementary school? You know, out there stuck in the woods. So the uh, parents said to themselves, you know. I have to work hard. I don't read and write so well. I can't do this and I can't do that. But my children are going to do better. And they expect it better of their children. Now, parents have about 80% of them. No expectation that their child learns anything. They just want them to pass and to graduate. Yep. Whether they learn anything is another matter. Right, yeah. You know, my wife's a registered nurse, and uh, everybody at the hospital got training in something and has a, uh, a license. And those people who hold licenses, they're never unemployed. They never. They don't get laid off, or they don't move to a new town and say, "Gee, where am I going to work?" 
they just go to the local hospital and go to work. Yep. And there's no more interviews anymore. You call the hospital and tell them you're a nurse. They'll say, okay, when can you come to work? It's it's literally like that. You know, what what kind of schedule you want? When can you get here? <laughs> yeah. So those those people don't have a hard time finding uh, finding jobs. Anybody who has a license of any kind, electrician, plumber, whatever, uh, you just don't see them unemployed. And, and you have to get some kind of training in order to get those. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in the day and age of technology, there's a lot of job positions that are going to go away as technology advances. But things like you said, the electricians and the plumbers and the nurses, it doesn't matter how advanced computers are. We're still always going to need those people. Yeah, and and they get a little bit harder to find as time goes by, uh, too. Uh, and, and your education can wear out. You know, you... You may graduate and you're 21, 20, 22 today, and, but unless you, you have to learn and kind of train over a lifetime because your education can wear out and become obsolete. It's like tools in a toolbox. You know, education is. You want to pack your toolbox real full because you're not sure what tools you're going to need in the future, and you have to, you have to pack yourself up with uh, plenty of skills. And when you go out to look for a job, you want to have tools in the box to do every kind of job that you can, or as many as you can. So you go out with an empty toolbox or a toolbox that's half full, uh, you start life like that, and it, you're just going to have problems. Yeah. I had my college debt, and uh, I paid it every month for 10 years. I don't know if they stretch out longer than 10 years now, but uh, uh, that's what the limit they were giving you in, in the old days. Uh, and it was just about as much as my, as my house payment. I... Uh, struggled along and I paid it and uh, there's just a whole bunch of it goes unpaid. Yeah, and there's certainly no shortage of people taking out loans currently. No, and uh, I, I have some theories about why they're making more use of that now. People just don't go to college anymore without some kind of debt, but they shouldn't be they shouldn't be surprised that at the other end you have to pay it. Yeah, I think that's the part they don't think about. Debt in general, I, I never did like debt and I paid that loan off and I paid my house off and uh, I paid my my truck my truck off. I drove that truck for 28 years and I'm still in the same house that I built in 78. <laughs> so uh, I got rid of uh, the big things that people usually acquire debt over and I just never got debt again. I just never did like debt. But I even got rid of a credit card. I went 20 years until I had, had to do some internet buying. You know, you buy from Amazon or something, mm-hmm. eBay. Until it needed, uh, uh, I needed a credit card for that. I went without a credit card for for twenty years, a solid twenty years. And uh, people don't think anything of just running up just a huge uh, credit card debt, and got to have a new car. I was thirty five years old before I owned my first new car. I, I drove old cars, used cars before then. And I, I don't know. Uh, I don't. I don't know how these young people go out and buy these brand new cars, and, and they've got their college debt and. And they've got their rent, and next thing you know, they're just out of money. I feel like it would be great if there was more of a of an emphasis on young people on you know learning how to budget and and financial control and you know in our area anyways they took away home ec and you know basic life skills that everybody needs to know and they're they're totally pushed by the wayside you're 100 percent right that there's a whole bunch of things that that uh young people need to, to learn even before they get out of high school but good gosh i wonder sometimes what the heck do they teach at home well you know? I'm, yeah <laughs> And, and and do the parents really know any better? Do they know something better to teach? Because they're in effects of, they're in effects of their own. Mm-hmm. You know, they got their own problems that they they've created over time. But, but you know, some things they, they keep teaching. Well, this ought to be taught in school, and that ought to be taught in school. And I'm thinking, good gosh, you know, I'm I'm just up here trying to teach my little subject up here at high school. Well, can't they teach something at home? Sure. You know, what are they teaching at home? So you have to wonder that sometimes. Yeah, I think parents are too busy working their multiple jobs, and it seems like sometimes parenting falls by the wayside in, in light of everything else. And home life is such a mess these days anyway. Yep. You know, without going into great detail, we, yeah. all, we all know that we all know what home life is like. It's such a, such a mess. And uh, I had a student living with a foreign student one time living with me for uh, – most of the school year, and he uh, he was learning English, and he, he did real good with English, but he didn't read it so fast and so well. So he would want me to sit down with him and read the textbooks to him, and I, I didn't mind doing that. I didn't have a problem with it because, like I said, he's he's struggling with the 
with the, the text material plus the handicap of English being a second language. So I sit down there with him. We, we do homework, and I thought, oh, good gosh, you know, this is exhausting. We're doing this every night, and uh, I just don't know other parents who have a whole bunch of duties. They have to do washing and ironing and cooking and, and who knows what else, and, uh, and can they really sit down with their kids for a couple of hours every night you know, like they need to? Yeah. So, and, and like I said, some of the homes are so chaotic, you know, you just, you just wonder. And it's been that way since the 70s, I believe, you know, the you know, disruptive, chaotic homes uh, often that you find. And uh, and so you just don't really see a lot of homework getting done. Yeah, it's kind of tragic. I don't I don't know what the answer is, but hopefully, you know, things can start maybe working their way to a more positive light. And, and like I said, I, I don't know how we get there, but, but I hope that things start to make the up uphill turn at least you have to live life strategically a strategy is a plan to win i don't care if you're running a foot race or you're uh, playing basketball or football everybody's got a plan on how to maximize their particular strength and apply it to that sport to get the best result you have to when you're running a race you know some of them uh, hold back and then they race forward at the end and some of them get out front and want to stay out front you know you just have to take whatever if you've got that much wind you can do that and and so you, you have to have a strategy and you have to live life strategically you have to know where the landmines are and walk around them and a lot of people just go run it blindly into the field and then one day they're wondering, oh gosh, you know, I got both my legs blown off a deck happened. I think that is one of the most accurate uh, representations or analogies of life that I've that I've heard. <laughs> yeah, and then when they get over age 50, the world just folds up on them like a house of cards. The, the, health, the health gets bad and they run out of money and they're at their maximum earning power, whatever whatever they're earning at that moment is as good as it's ever going to get. And they... Um, I said that the health goes bad, and sometimes uh, the family goes south, and uh, it uh, it really can come unwound if you don't have a plan. You know, if you don't have some kind of plan or goal or objective and work toward it. Yeah, I think that's the big thing: is life takes work. You can't just put on cruise control and hope it all plays out. You got to actually make the effort and put in the time and put in the energy to make it what you want it to be. Right. You got to make it happen. And what happens in your life is what you make happen or what you let happen. Yep. You know, life is going to happen one way or the other. You just let it happen to you or you can take some control over it. Yeah, absolutely. Even on the negative stuff, too. I mean, like you said, within reason, a lot of times it's what people let happen to them. So you can really arrange things to be the way that you want them to be. And, and you don't always have to be just a victim of fate. You know, your life is sum of all your choices that you made. And you have to make good choices every day. Every day we make choices that influence the future, not only the present, that influence the future. And and we it's the choices that we make in the action that we take every day that determines what our life will be tomorrow. Now, some things are unavoidable. You can't eliminate all the suffering in your life because some things are just happening out of what, what's called the, the natural friction of life. You know, you can't help it if somebody rear ends your car or you have death of uh, relatives nearby that you thought a lot of or, or that uh, you had some accident or, or maybe you got laid off from your job. Some things, they're just unavoidable, but you're going to do better if you have a plan and you live life with a plan and you live life strategically. Yeah, absolutely. I could not agree more. Yeah, if you, if you ask people, you ask anyone what they're going to be doing three years from now, what will their life be like three years from now? They can't tell you. Maybe some of them can't tell you three months from now. But people just don't, they they just don't think. And, and, and it's like uh, Earl Nightingale says, people become what they think about most of the time. Mm-hmm. You know, for better or for worse, people become what they think about most of the time. And a lot of times, they just don't think. Yeah. And so you just things just happen. And you spend your time, instead of acting, you spend your time reacting. Yeah, I uh, caused a, a moment of some internal uh, self-reflection there, I guess. But um, yeah, yeah, I, I, those are incredibly wise words. 
Yeah, we really have to go back over that and really visit that again, that people become what they think about most of the time. And so it comes incumbent on you to have good thoughts, constructive thoughts, healthy thoughts. If you don't, your life is not going to be any of those three. It's amazing how your mindsets, even just subconsciously, will change the outcome of your life. Your subconscious is something that uh, Americans don't really... I'm not sure if we're so well versed in it, but uh, your subconscious is something that's working all the time to help you solve problems and always working to your good. Love sometimes we pay attention to it and sometimes we don't. And sometimes we feed it positive thoughts, desires, and often we feed it the wrong things. But uh, your subconscious is always working to help you. It's like a huge filter. It filters out unnecessary things and takes you toward your goal. Yeah, well, I feel like I need to sit down and do some self-reflection now <laughs> and take a, you know, think more about where I want my life to be. Yeah, I want you to go on YouTube and look up Earl Nightingale, spell with an N. Earl Nightingale. He has several recordings. He, he made the first record ever that sold a million. All he does is talk on these records. But you, what you need to do is to, is to listen to his uh, recording called The Strangest Secret. And you need to listen to it four, five, six times, not just one. But two. And, and then listen to everything he's got to say, but start with The Strangest Secret. And it gives you a lot to think about. I will do that. Well, I hope we covered all your bases. We covered everything and more. And I, I really, from the bottom of my heart, I appreciate you taking the time to, to again, to talk oh, and share not only about the PFAL, but, you know, just about life. I, I love talking to people and getting other people's perspective. And there's a lot of lessons that you can take back, not only for your birds, but for your own self there. And I really there appreciate you your time. Yeah, don't forget about Earl Nightingale, the strangest secret, okay? I will absolutely look that up. And I'll put a link um, in good. this for anybody else that would like to look at it too. All right, very good. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I very much enjoyed it. Thank you, Douglas. All righty. We'll, we'll talk to you again someday, maybe. Yes, sir. I hope so. All right. All right. right. Bye-bye now. Thank you for listening to Backyard Bounty, a podcast by HeritageAcresMarket.com. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. If you have a question you'd like us to answer on the show, please email us at ask at HeritageAcresMarket.com. Also find us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at Heritage Acres Market. All the links mentioned in this podcast will be included in the description. See you again next week.